All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're not going to wait uh, any longer because we have a lot to talk about and uh, only limited amount of time. So um, my name is Stan Van Hoff. I'm Business Development Manager at Exclusive Networks. And we organized this session because we, yeah, we see almost every vendor out there is using buzzwords like AI, machine learning, uh, and so on. So we thought it's time to see actually how our next-gen vendors are using that. A uh, little warning, do not lose focus. Put away your phone and close your email because once you hop off, the train is gone. Our pre-sales David will start with a machine learning intro. And next up, we have three vendors who will talk about how they use it in their technology. We have Gal Sadeh from Silverfort. Uh, Silverfort is a unified identity protection platform, which enables multi-factor authentication, risk-based authentication, and zero trust policies across all sensitive corporate and cloud assets, including systems that couldn't be protected until today. Next up is Ida Kotler from Sentinel One. It's an XDR player with focus on process behavior. One platform to prevent, detect, respond, and hunt in the context of all enterprise assets. There's a reason why they have had this perfect score on the latest MITRE attack testing. Finally, we have Dan Bridges from Exadim. Exadim is a security vendor known for their advanced behavior analytics. Every log known to mankind can go to their data lake, but it doesn't matter if you already have a scene in place, they can also work on top of your existing infrastructure. They will help you with alert triage, response automation, threat hunting, and so on. All right, now, Davey, uh, the honor is yours. Please continue. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So like Stan said, uh, I'm, going to the next slide. I'm going to give you a short introduction on some machine learning uh, endpoint concepts. Let's start first with the definition of machine learning and what, what is it really? Uh, ma machine learning and the definition is here is actually a computer program that learns from input that you give it. We call this an experience E. And it learns how to perform a task T. That task can be like classification, predicting a value, um, searching for anomalies, stuff like that. So it, so it, it performs a task T from an input that you give it. And the more you give it from that input, the better it becomes at doing its task T. Right? We measure that with a performance that we call P. It's actually a, a sort of a cost to see how well the algorithm uh, or the model that we learn performs. The main difference here between a normal computer program, let's say, and machine learning is that you do not program the task T, but you program to learn from the input and to learn how to do a task, but not the task itself. That is the big uh, difference, let's say. We're going to talk today uh, briefly on random forests. So to start with random forest is a supervised machine learning algorithm. And you probably all heard about supervised, unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithms. You, you, you came across the term multiple times probably. Supervised really means that you, you give the, the algorithm or uh, that you will learn, on, uh, you give it the data with the expected outcome. So with the, for example, labels, like a, like a malware label, like it's a malicious or it's a benign file. That's a labeled information that you give to the algorithm to learn on. In contrast, unsupervised, you don't give it information to, to uh, that is labeled or has a desired outcome, but you ask the algorithm to search for, like, for example, clusters or correlations between data points. So that's the big difference. Uh, today, we're gonna, uh, for the random forest, we're going to work on the supervised part. Now, random forests are used for classification and regression. So in classification, we talk about uh, predicting a certain class. For example, here, uh, you get a random forest saying we predict a class A or a class B. So you get a new instance, you throw it at the model, and the model will predict if your instance belongs to A or B. On the other hand, you have a regression, which you, for example, predict a value or a probability or something. Now, random forests use decision trees, as you can see in the image here at the right side. Right? It uses a lot of decision trees. What it actually does it is inside there are multiple decision trees making uh, their own individual uh, prediction on an instance. And that individual uh, prediction will then be used in a majority voting, for example, or an averaging to predict the final class for the new instance that you throw at it. Right? Now, before we continue, let's look a bit more in depth into the mathematics of this algorithm and, and look what it does. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. That's a, it's a hand-on session. It was just a little stupid joke. That we put in here. But what is important is the concept of samples, features, and labels. Right? You will see this a lot in, in machine learning. You encounter this a lot. What, what is this? Right? Machine learning needs to be done on a sort of a factorized uh, data format. That's what you see here. You got samples 
uh, listed here, and then you got columns describing the features, right? So a sample is, is uh, a feature, sorry, describes a sample uh, based on different uh, parameters, and it, it differentiates between multiple samples, or maybe it correlates between them. It has just several features that describe each sample. That's important to have, that's our data, and we also have labels, right? The last column here shows the label for each sample. That's actually our supervised part, where we show that sample one has a zero has a label of zero, sample two has a label of one, et cetera, et cetera. This can mean anything in our case that will be a benign and malicious file, right? But that's the concept of a sample, having describing the sample with features and having a label for each sample available to learn on. I'm gonna work with the Ember data set. It's a data set of one million PE files, so portable executable files uh, for the Windows platform. And these files are, or the samples in these files are actually classified as malicious, as benign or unlabeled. So we don't know if they're benign or malicious, that, that happens, right? That's also in the data set. And basically the, there's an X and a Y, the X is a feature set data and the Y are the labels. And the guys from Ember, so it's available on GitHub. I'll show in a second, um, they make available this data set and they also give you the possibility to split it up in a training set and in a test set. Now we need this because we will learn, our algorithm will learn a model based on the training data. So the features in X train and the labels in Y train. And then we will use the model that we have learned to predict the labels for the X test set. We're gonna predict the labels for D set and we're gonna compare it with the labels that we have. This way we know if our algorithm or our model, I must say, um, performs well or not. Now in this data set, there, like I said, one million samples. Uh, my laptop didn't like one million samples, it was a bit too much, so I uh, narrowed it down to 160,000, uh, that's about 20% of the set, and uh, 20,000 of the test set um, to make it a bit more uh, possible to do the algorithms. And you see also that there are 2,381 features, so 2,381 uh, 2, columns describing each sample. So that's a lot of data, that's a lot of data. So let's jump over to uh, our Jupyter Notebook. It's a uh, used a lot in machine learning and data scientists. It's based on Python. Um, so you can run this uh, code into a browser. Here you start with actually getting into the, uh, getting the Ember data set, um, set inside this platform. And if we go to the paper, there's a paper belonging to the Ember data set. It shows you here uh, on the bottom, the structure, for example, of a PE file, how it, how it looks like. Um, maybe some of you know it. Um, that's the structure. And a bit further on, I will show how they describe a, um, how to describe a file. So you see here that they give you a JSON with a SHA value. They give it a label, as we said. Uh, but also, for example, they say, oh, uh, this file imports kernel uh, 32.dll. It calls this function, et cetera, et cetera. This is a description of a sample, of a file, but we cannot input this into a machine learning algorithm. It needs to be factorized, like I said, to a format that we can use for learning. And these guys provide this, luckily for us, so here you can see we're loading in the one million samples, and then here we create X train, Y train, X test, and Y test by reading in the factorized data and then con converting the JSON format to a factorized format, which results in the end in uh, like I said, 2,381 features. And um, I use a subset, like I said, of 160,000 uh, values to start my learning and do the testing on 20,000 uh, samples. So once data, preparing the data is very important in machine learning, but once we have the data, we can start the learning part. Now, the learning part uh, using um, scikit-learn, by the way, in Python, is actually just starting or creating a decision tree in this case. So we start very simple with one tree. And I say I want it to have a maximum depth of three. So I don't, need, I don't want it to be bigger than that. And I'm going to fit it to our training data. So I'm giving it the training data, the features, and I'm giving it the labels for those samples that, that we give it to it. And we start like fit it. Right? Learn, learn on, on this data and how um, and build a model. And this is the result. This is the result, a decision tree that the algorithm has learned. This is our model uh, for the data that we throw at it with a maximum depth of three layers. Right? How do you read this? How, how, how do you use this actually? The goal is that when you have a new instance that you can throw it at this model and the model will tell you if that new instance is malicious or benign. That's what we want to do. We want classification. 
how does this work? You start at the top node and you see here that it starts with looking at feature 637 in the data set. And it will look at, so for a sample, at that feature, compare it to this value, and then go to the left or the right. And it does it exactly for the same way for all the other nodes until it ends up in a leaf node. Now you can see here on the root node that we indeed learned from 160,000 samples and that these samples are distributed among the three classes. So we have the unlabeled, we have the benigns, and we have the malicious uh, samples. And you can see that each node actually makes a separation this way. When we end up in a leaf node here at the bottom, you'll see that that separation gets more clearer and clearer, right? So here only uh, there are 36,000 samples, only uh, 1,700 are unlabeled, and there are 34,000 are actually in the benign section. That means if you throw a new sample to this model and you're traversing it and you're ending up here at the bottom left, you're pretty sure that your sample is benign. That's about 94% for this node. And that's also what the Gini value represents that actually the purity of this node. Now, the problem is this one is good, but the other ones are bad. And as you can see, um, for example, this one, if you end up here, it has no clue if it's uh, benign or malicious. So it's, it's, it's I can tell you up front now, it's a bad tree. It's, it's, not, uh, it's a bad model. It won't really work that well. Of course, we knew that. It's a simple uh, calculation. But give you an idea how it works, you input a new sample and you start reversing these different features. You, you compare the features that you have uh, with what is, is here in the decision. And then you end up in a leaf note making the prediction for the classification. And now we can actually do that on our test set. So we can actually say, you know what, make prediction using this tree on the whole test subset, the 20,000 samples that I have. And I print out, so you predict the labels, and I print out the first 20 labels. And this is the result. Now I have the labels of my test subset. I know them up front, so I can also print these out and com start comparing. As you can see, the first three, for example, are well compared. That's correct. The other three are not good. So I predict zero actually should be one. Here it's also wrong. And then here all these are wrong. So the result is not that good. And we can automate the result. We can allow the algorithm or the program to calculate the result uh, by itself by calculating the root mean square error over the whole uh, prediction. And we get a value of 0 0.74, uh, which is not good because you're predicting a value of zero or one and you make a mistake of 0 0.74 at average. It's, it, it's bad. It's really bad. So how can we improve? How can we improve the, 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 the model? We can start with cross-validation, which means that you calculate uh, multiple trees. In this case, we do a cross-validation of 10. So we calculate 10 trees on our training set. It, internally, it uses a, a split into a validation set and stuff like that. It's not important. Uh, remember, it, it's just, it calculates 10 trees and it takes the best one out. Now, here you can see the score of each of the trees that has been calculated. You can imagine it takes a bit more time because it needs to do it 10 times. But it gives you the result of each tree, and then it takes the average, uh, like the mean score of, of what we have. It's a bit better, right? We're on, we were on 0 0.74, now it's 0 0.72. Not really impressive, a bit better. But we can move on to random forests. Like I said in the slide deck, we can combine decision trees and then get the combined output to make the, the prediction or the classification. We do it a similar way. We build a random forest classifier, and we say we wanted to use 100 decision trees internally with a maximum depth of five, and only use 50 features. Right? Do not use 2,381 features, only use 50. Calculate those trees, combine them in the random forest classifier, fit them on our training data, and we do exactly the same prediction. We're gonna predict on our test subset, we print out the first 20 resulting labels, and let's compare it again with the label that we know that we have. And look at the result. This is uh, a bit surprising, I must say, that when I did it, that it's all good. But when I calculate the root mean square error over the 20,000 values that are in here, uh, we only see 20 that I print out, but there are 20,000 values, uh, we get a score of 0 0.489. So that's a lot better than the 0 0.72 or 0.74 that we had. Uh, but still not good enough. Uh, it's uh, still a big mistake uh, in average. Um, but to give you an idea how the improvement works, this is uh, definitely an improvement already uh, in comparison with a single or only a few decision trees. Now, the question is, how do you know that these parameters are well, that they are good? 
Maybe the best three has a depth of seven. Maybe we don't need 100 estimators. Maybe 50 is sufficient. And maybe we need 100 features and another 50 features. These parameters are actually called hyperparameters of the algorithm. And you can also learn on that. You can let's, let's visualize it as leveling up the algorithm, the learning. Right? And you can start learning in hyperparameter space. That is what the grid search, for example, does. The grid search cross-validation will play around with the parameters in certain ranges and, and try to estimate, like, let's calculate a random forest with other uh, depths and other amount of estimators and look at the result and get the best classifier out of it. I'm not going to go in depth on that because I'm limited on time, but it gives you an idea on how you can improve uh, machine learning. And then finally, to end up, I'll, I'd like to visualize something to give you a bit of an idea on how an algorithm makes decisions. Here I calculated a random force classifier. I did 20 trees inside, maximum depth of three, and I only calculated on two um, features, the first and the second feature. And this way, I was able to plot it out. So we have the first feature on the X, second feature on the X2, uh, on the Y, sorry, so X1, X2. And you can see here the different the zones. So the green zone is the benign zone, and the yellow zone is the malicious zone. The blue dots are the, the benign samples, and the yellow dots are actually the malicious samples. And you can see that our decision tree, or our random force classifier, makes a boundary, puts boundaries inside, and makes predictions uh, based on the value of X1 and X2, if it's benign or if it's malicious. And you can also see that it makes a lot of mistakes, because there are a lot of uh, yellows in here, and also blue ones are in the other zone, just to give you a visual idea. And again, from this random force classifier, I can take out a random a tree, let's say I want to take number five of the 20 trees, and you get the same sort of tree visualized here. And you can see that it's now only using feature zero or feature one, because that's the only two features that it's been learned on, and it tries to make prediction based on those two features. So I hope it was a bit quick, and I hope it was a lot, but I hope it, it, it gives you a bit of an idea of how um, decision trees work. It's just one of the many algorithms that exist in the machine learning, but it can be visualized, so that's always good to show. And with this said, I'm uh, leaving uh, the word to Gal, who will explain a bit how machine learning is used in uh, Silverfort. Gal, up to you. Thank you, David, for the question. Um, so, uh, hi, so I'm, I'm going to be talking uh, today about lateral movement attacks and how to detect them in real time with machine learning. Um, before I'm talking about the machine learning and the detection methods, we, I think we need to understand uh, better what lateral movement attacks are. So, um, assuming I have an attacker and he got somehow into a network and he got the credential of a user. Uh, what he can uh, does with this uh, uh, credential is to uh, log in to a different computer in the network. And once he is in that that computer, uh, he can harvest more credentials, or you use even that that the credential he has um, to move to another computer, and so on. And usually, the goal of of that attacker is to uh, to reach a crown jewel, uh, a very valuable asset in the network. Could be um, a database, a computer that contains sensitive information, a cloud asset, et cetera. Um, and when the attacker reached that asset, uh, he wins. He got what he wanted. So let's zoom in to what the attacker actually does when he logs in or propagates to another computer. So First, he got the credentials uh, um, uh, of a user using uh, probably a malware, and then he moved to another asset. And the action of moving to another asset requires authentication. And what we need to understand is that authentication is a legitimate action in networks. When I log into my computer, I, I, I have to authenticate with the uh, Active Directory or, or the Azure. AD or ping or whatever IDP um, you we have or you have in your environment. And this is um, very important for understanding uh, how lateral movement works and what's needed uh, for us so we can detect them efficiently. Um, because many methods for lateral movement attack detections uh, tries to identify specific attacking tools, such as Mimikatz, 
Um, but the problem with that is that it doesn't cover cases where the, uh, the attacker moves just literally has the credentials some, somehow. Um, and, and actually all, all the movements are all legitimate. Yeah, I mean, he uses uh, probably malware to harvest credentials, but the movement itself um, is a legitimate way. And what I'm gonna show you next is uh, how to detect lateral movement based on authentication traffic in the network. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to, tr to try to find uh, the paths an attacker might does and to differentiate uh, from normal behavior of a user. So let's move to the uh, Jupyter Notebook. And let me show you uh, a short demonstration I, I prepared in advance. So what you can see here um, is a picture of a network, it's a small one just for the demonstration, but it's based on real networks um, we've seen before. And every circle here uh, represents a user and every triangle represents a server and every edge that connects them represents an authentication. It means that the user authenticated with the server. Um, the edges, by the way, contains more attributes such as the timestamp, the authentication request occurred, but I cannot show you that on the graph because uh, it will be too messy. And the goal here is to find several edges, several authentication requests that together represent the potential lateral movement attack. So you can see here that we have like, I don't know, uh, 100 or 200 uh, users and computers and much more edges and much, much more potential paths. The potential number of potential passes is ex exponential with the number of entities um, and authentication requests in the network. So this is a very small network, but in huge networks, um, you cannot even go over, you cannot enumerate over all the potential passes. So finding the one that represents the, uh, the lateral movement attack is very hard. And this is where machine learning uh, uh, comes to our help. So the first thing we'll do is we'll use a um, clustering algorithm uh, to cluster that network to communities where a community is a group of users and computers where the users authenticate very frequently in all the servers that are in the same community. You should think about it as uh, you have an R&D department in your organization. It means that um, all the users and the servers, like the workstations of, of the people there are likely to be in the same community. Um, it might be uh, people from the same site, the marketing department, et cetera. To do that, we use an algorithm called the Lovain method, uh, which invented by the way, by the way, in Belgium. Um, and let me just show you that. It will, it will be very clear. Uh, you can see that I ran everything in real time, and what the algorithm just did is color every entity, every user and server in my network in a color that represents the community. Um, the entity belongs to. Uh, and you can see here that there are edges, there are authentication requests between entities in different communities, and it does make sense. I mean, if I'm in the R&D department, it does not mean that I cannot authenticate with a um, server that belongs to another department. Or, for example, if there is a, a community that represents uh, the help desk, uh, they need to log in to, to another workstation to, to assist uh, people. So it makes sense that um, the communities authenticate with each other, but what we need to understand is that if I'm an attacker, I'll probably uh, start with a small or minor community. I'll probably have credentials of, uh, of a user that's uh, wasn't careful enough and exposed somehow with credentials. And probably the value asset that I want to reach in the end locate, is located in a different community. So it means that I'll have to cross several communities, at least one before I will reach my goal. So now what, what we should do, the next step of the algorithm, 
um, is to focus only on the edges that cross different communities. So here they are, and you can see that there are much less edges that cross communities than edges within communities. So if, if before it was impossible to enumerate over all the passes, now it, it's a bit more possible. And what makes it even more possible is the fact that uh, not all the communities are equal. I mean, there are some communities that are more important or, or less important than others based on their behavior. And, and just an example for that, here in this small graph I show you, um, every node represents the community and an edge represents that the two communities uh, communicate with each other. And you can see, for example, that the teal community communicates only with the blue one and the gray one, uh, but the blue one uh, communicates with all the other communities. So the blue one very likely to be the helpless community and the teal community is more isolated community. So why, why it helps us? When two isolated communities communicate with each other, it's much more suspicious than um, a community that communicates with all the other communities perform an action. So it helps us actually to um, estimate the probability that a user from one community will authenticate with a user, with a server in a different community. So uh, let's focus even more on the edges that uh, cross communities. You can see here now that um, uh, it's much more clear. We can even see some pattern ourselves. So in advance, I found that the passes that might be um, interesting. So here they are, uh, they're marked in yellow. And you can see that they cross several communities. And now we, we have a lot of potential level movement passes and what we can do is we can eliminate them by some attributes that we know about the entities that involved in that potential pass. For example, we know if the users are admins or if the servers are workstations or web servers, etc. So after we have some candidates for uh, potential lateral movement passes, we can start eliminating them. And if I, well, let's zoom out for, for a second. You can see here that we started with a like almost blank graph, like we didn't have information um, about the network at all. And, and we found here two potential paths that might represent uh, a lateral movement effects. So a, a couple of things to summarize, to summarize stuff. So what I, what I showed you now is just um, a, a short demonstration that uh, show the concept of the algorithm. And we use the Louvain, uh, which is a clustering uh, algorithm that runs super fast on networks uh, to, uh, to cluster the network of communities. And after that, we were able to, so in real time, we don't really enumerate over all the potential passes across communities and, and actually um, a potential pass, a potential lateral movement pass might contain edges within communities. So uh, th th there is a, a bit details about the real algorithm, but the concepts are here. And the nice thing is that we've tried it on many networks, and on average, if, if, if we give a, a couple like between one to four uh, potential paths a day, and this is something human being can um, investigate deeply and you can say, oh, okay, this is a false positive or this requires deep investigation. And the nice thing is that even things that required deep investigation uh, and weren't lateral movement attacks uh, were interesting somehow. The reasons why um, user uh, crossed too many communities was, it was interesting. Um, and the last thing uh, about the real time. So I told you before that uh, we, we can 
we de can detect those things in real time, but we can also block it in real time because um, once lateral movement starts, I mean, we can see that uh, user crosses too many communities in a short time. And what we can do is we can limit access to other communities. So silver for platforms enables to um, uh, to require MFA or even block authentication requests in the entire network. Uh, so when we see uh, the beginning of lateral movement attack, uh, we can stop it because those kind of attacks, uh, sometimes it's too late to detect after they already occurred because the damage uh, might be uh, um, very harmful to your network. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening. All right, great. Thank you very much for this uh, session. All right, next up is um, Ido from Ido. Yes. Hi. Uh, Ido, sorry, Ido. <laughs> All right, you can share your screen now. Great. Uh, I'm guessing you can see it. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so my name is Ido. I'm from the innovation team at Sentinel. Um, if I'm talking too fast or if something is not clear, or if you just have any questions, please write them. I try to address them during these 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a new thing we are doing in Sentinel-1 that is called behavioral similarity. There are already some applications that are being used in production, but we are also more ambitious. And I'm also going to talk to you about like the far-reaching ideas we're working on that will probably be in the field in six months or a year from now, but we are very certain that they will happen. Um, oh, why is it not moving? Great. So first, like an intuition. Um, I'm guessing all of you heard on the solar winds attack, like even my parents asked me about them. Like I, I know that it's been in the news all over. And although all of our customers were protected from the solar winds, many of them were concerned on it. So obviously, um, here in the Sentinel-1 platform, you can see that you can hunt for many things, and even you can hunt for specific things when events come. And those queries that used for hunting generally look something like that. So there are usual IOCs that were published, like SHA-1s or IPs or DNS requests. And then we are looking for those things online uh, in our data. But that's not perfect, because obviously there are things that are updating all the time and it requires the people here or the people like our customers to know and search for those specific things. And also most probably there are things that are just not discovered and people are not going to publish either because they don't want it to be known for everyone or because they haven't found out about it. Um, so what if we could do something like that? Not look for a specific IOC that is being published, but say, I know what Sunburst look like. Please look for things that look just like Sunburst. Uh, so this is like the far-reaching goal of what we have at Similarity wants to do. So I'm going to talk about like four main things if I have the time. Uh, first, similarity. What does this generally mean? What is it good for? Secondly, how do we do it specifically in Sentinel-1? And then I'm going to talk about two examples of how we already use it today, which is firstly on stock empowerment and secondly, and secondly about researching incidents. Um, so just like a few uh, things, generally speaking, we use the concept of a storyline in Sentinel-1. What does that mean? That means that um, Sentinel-1 monitors many things in the agents, so processes, files, and different entities that the computer uses. And then it aggregates them together uh, to uh, one concept to show that things are connected to one another. Um, so it can segment the event to different contexts, and then you can look at a specific context that know that the things within this context are related to one another. This is a thing we already do for many years. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, so let's look at an example of a storyline. You can see that there is probably the malicious PowerShell. It has been created from a WinWorld, but we can tell that probably WinWorld is not a malicious thing, and only the thing that was created from the WinWorld onwards is a malicious. So segmenting those connected things is a hard thing that we do. But now we have the concept of a storyline, and then we can know that storylines represent 
a thing that happens in a specific context on one machine. Okay, so now let's talk on behavioral similarity or storyline similarity. So let's say we'll have a machine somehow that can take such storylines and put them on a two-dimensional um, representation. Uh, like two-dimensional is obviously a small one, we use much bigger ones, but let's make it simple. So why would we want to do that? If we have such machines, we could look at different storylines and put them on a two-dimensional uh, space. And when we do that, we can see that some points are closer to each other than other points. And then we say that probably those storylines represent things that are closer to one another. So let's say we have this concept. What can we do with it? Uh, so for example, let's say those are many, many points of like this amazing machine that can put it on a two-dimensional space. We can see that there are many different clusters within this um, space. So let's look at like those two clusters. And if we look at them, we might be able to say those things are all malwares and those things are all benign. And this classification can happen to malware versus benign, but it can also happen for like more granular things. So malware families or profiling many different users' behaviors or things like that, which is very useful in many different cases. Um, another thing that can be helpful for is to empowering analysts generally. So let's say you're looking at a thousand internet that has happened on your network, if you are a big company, then having those clusters can help you to look at specific things with the context that are related to one another, or even filter certain things if you're looking for a specific incident. So you know that something has happened, you're looking for things that are connected to these things that you know that has happened. So you can see hey, those things are unrelated, those are also unrelated, those two. So now you're filtering to very small amounts of data to look for, which is very helpful because otherwise it would have taken a lot of time. So, oh, another thing is probably you could look for anomalous behavior. So if this is like a user that has used a specific software, you can see that those things are very different than the rest of the things. So, okay, this ID sounds great, but how are we going to actually make it happen? So our mantra is not to find just any representation, but find a meaningful representation. So the first things you need for that are meaningful features. And luckily here in Sentinel-1, we have a lot of features in our EDR platform. So we have a lot of things for every process, for every thread, for every IP connection, for every file modification, for every login, registries, a lot of different things that we know that they have happened, but also we know many different things about what specifically was done in those things. So a storyline at the end looks something like that for us. So we have many different events. Um, and we can draw those events and say, this process has created a file. This process has had the network connections. Um, just the, those connections are already quite meaningful when we are looking at our representation. But also we have uh, more information on that. So we have like, is this file an exa? Does this file have a high entropy? Is the death IP a local? Uh, and many, many different features, like thousands of features for each such event. So, okay, we have the features. Now we can put them into a neural network and get such representation. But still you need to ask me like, how do we make, how do we train this? Like, how do we make this representation meaningful? So generally speaking, if we just want to have some classification, getting those boundaries is an easy thing to imagine. But talking about the general concept of representation or similarity is a little harder. So. Something we use is something that is called metric learning. Um, what does metric learning do? It tries to find a metric to say if two things are close or not. So the idea comes, um, the, a, a general thing that is used, it's things called CMEs networks, which is often used on, uh, let's say, face recognition. When you have many different faces and you want to find a similar face to one another to know that this is a specific person. What you do here is you take the same network, you put two faces through this network and get do representation, and the loss function or the things that actually trains your network is whether those two faces come from the same group or not from the same group. So then you like subtract the two representation, and if they're the same person, you want it to be close to zero. If they're not the same person, you want it to be as far away as possible. So obviously we don't use faces, but we can do the same thing with storylines. We take our representations of features of storylines, we put them through the behavioral similarity network, and then we try to push things that are close together to be closer and push away things that we know that are not from the same group. So that's the general concept of how do we do it. Um, 
So let's talk about the examples. Uh, so firstly, about SOC empowerment. Um, this is already used by Vigilance MDR, which is our own SOC that we sell to other companies, but this will probably be used as a feature to other SOCs as well in the near future. So what's the problem space here specifically? So no product is perfect. So obviously there are going to be false positives in some aspects. And this, when we talk about big organization, can be very harmful because that means that if you have a million computers, then that could be a thousand alerts you get a day. And those alerts often come from ver different versions of the product or different types of alert. And that, therefore it takes a lot of time to know how to handle each of the alerts. And also the cost of a mistake is extremely high because if you say that something is benign, but actually it is malicious, then you have a ransomware on your computers that you just looked over and missed. So we don't want that to happen. So what are we going to do with behavioral similarity? We're going to do automatic threat triage, which means that we are going to look at the behavior of those incidents and then say if those incidents are close to things that we thought that are false positives before or close to things that we thought are true positive. That could help firstly to prevent mistakes because we could tell you we think those things are true positives, so don't like say that they are false positives, but also it can reduce the response time in many aspects because it can tell you in like very high percentage what are you actually seeing, what was it connected to, and therefore make you to, a, to be able to make much more sophisticated responses to it in much little time. Um, so that's one example that is already in use. You can see that this is like a two-dimensional um, presentation of it. Obviously, like when you look at higher dimension, it looks even better, but you can see that even from looking at this, most the red points represent like um, the uh, false positives and the green dots represent the true positives. You can see that they are clustered together. So it's very easy to say if you are close to another false positive, you are probably a false positive yourself. Um, so this is one example. Another is when researching incidents. So let's look at Sunburst again. We can look at all of the SolarWinds processes that we've seen in Sentinel-1. So we can see that a lot of them are clustered very neatly together uh, in this representation. So if we try to cluster them using any cluster algorithm, you can see that many of them look similar to one another, which probably means that if you've seen them across many different machines on many different organizations for a lot of time, they are probably benign. So we'll try to look at the things that are not in a very big cluster. And then it reduces the space you want to research for like very significantly. So for example, if we look at this specific dot, we can see that it was uh, detected as a threat and it's actually a threat by something that is not the Orion, but a different product on SolarWinds. And it is very high likely to be a true positive. So if we look at other points, we could find things that maybe uh, we've missed or maybe act very differently to any other SolarWinds thing that we've seen. Um, so that's it. That's the two examples I wanted to talk on. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, let's move on. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, I think it was very clear. Uh, if there are any questions, we uh, we will answer them at the end of the session. Uh, I great. suggest we hop on to the next speaker, and that's Dan. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Let me make you a presenter, Dan. Then you can share your screen. All right, then I can see your screen, but I can't hear you. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, awesome, brilliant. Thank you everyone for coming on the call. A um, uh, quick introduction of me. My name is Dan Bridges, and I'm the technical director of EMEA Channels um, for Exabeam. So I look after technical relationships uh, with all of our channel partners uh, and distributors across EMEA. So um, I'll probably talk maybe slightly differently um, uh, for some of these factors and explain where um, machine learning, AI, statistical detection, statistical analysis, where these are splattered around um, the Exabeam uh, solution set. Because um, we actually do quite a few different things. Exabeam has um, a lot more data that we need to process. Um, you know, we are, I guess, in old school money, you'd call us a scene platform. 
Uh, I think in new school money, you'd call us uh, an open XDR platform. Um, but we take in huge, huge amounts of data and um, and deliver some successful and, and um, manageable outcomes for an analyst to understand. The end goal is to have an analyst understand something and be able to take actions on something and respond to a potential to, to an incident. Now, there's lots of things that we have to do in that phase and multiply those up by the number of potential log or information sources we have. And that's something that a person on their own can't do. They can't manage, analyze, investigate all that kind of data. So we need to use some um, we need to use machines to do some of that. Now, some of that is from machine learning, from some um, uh, unsupervised algorithms. Um, some of it is from some, from some very, very powerful statistical analysis and data science. Um, and we have some other clever algorithms in there for Bayesian scoring as well um, to help provide the analyst with information that they can understand quickly. Now, it's all great looking at um, the kind of build up of some of the algorithms, but the people that actually need to use it need something quick, fast that they can understand. So let's look at machine learning and where we plug that in here. So um, we actually have some machine learning algorithms that, um, that provide us um, context information all through this path. And there are things that we do um, uh, for estimating what context is. I'll come to those in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slide or two, but they are actually used through the entire life cycle um, uh, of this use case content and these outcomes that we're bringing to an analyst. We actually have some sneaky machine learning uh, actually built into something slightly prior to collection. Um, obviously, collection and um, data analysis, um, parsing, as it were, um, taking this log information and making it meaningful and taking the parts we want. Parsing is, um, anyone who's worked with a, an old school scene platform, parsing is, is painful. Um, uh, we actually wrote uh, some machine learning algorithms to write parsers for us. Um, it's not actually in our kind of on-site code. Um, we have it in one of our cloud platforms uh, where you can upload log samples and we'll go and automatically write a parser for you. It needs a bit of checking, obviously, but it gets pretty close. So there's actually a few things uh, kicking around that uh, use machine learning in, in slightly different ways. But you can see all the tasks that we have across data collection, um, the detection that we're doing and how we're doing those types of detections. And then we move into some of the super clever stuff where we're using the machine learned context and the machine learned detections to then help build automation into the triage and in auto investigate um, uh, of incidents, of users, of devices, and then actually help analysts then provide effective uh, responses um, to incidents. So let's take a little look at how we um, how we do that and where we use those types of things. So machine learning in our OpenXDR platform gives us uh, contextual intelligence. It helps us um, work out what a server is, what a workstation is. It helps us plug in contextualized information into our detection algorithms. Um, it helps us categorize different types of users, different types of groups, it helps us work out what a um, what a service account is, for example, uh, as opposed to a user. Um, we can use it to, uh, to, to, to classify those, even if they're not in the right group. We can uh, then gives us the ability to, um, you know, detect when a service account starts behaving like a user, for example. And we also have some targeted detection use cases in there domain generation algorithms, phishing algorithms, things like that, that we're actually using machine learning um, machine learning for in there. Now also a larger part of the AI, I suppose again, this is kind of some different terms, depending on, depending on what book you read or depending on what input you take, whether you call statistical analysis machine learning, is a machine doing something, um, or whether you call it AI, um, there's a huge, huge amount of statistical analysis that we're using here, but we can't do that statistical analysis without having the context intelligence that's been provided to us by our machine learning algorithms. Now, the statistical analysis, as you've seen from some of the uh, previous presentations, you see those, you know, those complex charts come up. You know, there's some computation that happens and a number gets plotted on a graph. 
and then you then need to work out or the, the, the solution then works out whether or not that's weird or you know whether it's in this group or whether it's in a bottom right group or a top left group and tries to draw some circles around things and tries to find some boundaries. So we're doing a similar thing in our statistical analysis here for our, for our anomaly detection. And I'll actually show you uh, actually in our, you know, our analysts, your, the, 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 your analysts that use the solution, we show all that information. We make it nice and simple to read and you can understand it. We then have some advanced um, uh, mathematical scoring um, against some analysis that happens in our Bayesian scoring al algorithms, where we start to adjust risk scores that we add into to, um, particular users or devices sessions. Again, I'll show you kind of some of the stuff as we work through those. So just a quick look at some of the um, uh, machine learning that we use for context estimation. These are some of the use cases that we have for that, why we do it. Uh, and what values we actually draw out from those. So you can see in here, this gives you an idea of, of, of why we use machine learning in here. Now, this is helping us provide information which we can then pass further down that line, further down that six step line um, that, uh, that I showed you at the beginning on why that, um, uh, that machine learning is helpful and how we use it for every single stage of detection investigation and response as well because that's built on some of the information that we've used at the front end now for detection this is where some of the stuff gets a little bit more complicated um, we have um, machine learning detection in here for some of the complex things um, you know we have our own algorithms that we've actually written you can actually go and look it up on my tape i get time i show you the page um, you know, we've got some published um, um, machine learning algorithms which we use for domain generation um, detection, uh, dynamic domain generation detection. That helps us, again, for a reason. Why do we do that? That helps us with our malware communication. Those things tend to be used in, in, in malware. So there needs to be a reason for us to do these things. But these use cases in here, you can see we do some of the stuff for phishing detection. There's some, there's some command line um, detection that happens, but perhaps not quite in as much depth um, uh, as solutions like Sensible One will do, um, uh, or some of the uh, network detection solutions. You know, we've got a few things in there, but then that's, again, the beauty of the Exabeam solution is that we are an open XDR solution, which means we can take Sensible One. Um, uh, information through and we can take the alerts and the information they provide us and then use that in our detections and our investigations along with all the other logs and all the other data and information that's around the rest of the network again even from network detection solutions as well so there's lots and lots of use cases that we have in here for the detection of actually how we do it now again just to give you a little bit of an idea about some of the statistical profiling that we do um, uh, we have information that comes through we have some classifications of an event type uh, there's a few of those into here into windows security feeds database that kind of stuff we then have a different set of statistical models that we use categorical numerical clustering and numerical time of week now we actually hold a huge huge number of these um, uh, data science models these um, uh, statistical um, classification models per user and per device. So a lot of the computation is because it's large scale in an Exiving platform. Uh, just to give you an example, for each user in an organization, we'll have about 600 of these models, uh, depending on log sources of these categorical numerical clustering and time of week um, uh, models, about 600 per user. So even in a thousand user organization, that's 600,000 statistical models that we're feeding with information that has taken in information from our machine learning algorithms to help us with some of that context information. But they continually learn. Again, classic, is, that, is that true machine learning? Probably not, but it's continually learning. Every single log feed we come in feeds a data point in one of our models, which is then used for entity profiling, anomaly scoring, histogram conditioning, and the detections that we have into those for our statistical analysis. And they, like I said, they continually learn. That's not something that an analyst has to go back and plug in. 600,000 models that are continually learning based on the data that comes out of the log feeds. And that's just not one model that gets updated. One, one log event, as it were, a VPN event, might have, I don't know, 10 pieces of metadata that are useful. Each of those pieces of metadata then goes and updates a model. 
in real time, near real time, um, you know, sub second type analysis for this. So it's continually learning and it's live. So very, very powerful set of, uh, of, of joined up machine learning outputs into context and for detections and then into the data science models as well. Again, I'll show you a couple of these in a second. So let's take a little look at what we have in some of these. So this here is one of the timelines that we actually show. Uh, I pulled this one out straight away. This is our um, uh, kind of analyst view of, of actually what would be seen. And we can see here something that we've used our um, uh, domain generation algorithm score to uh, 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 our domain generation algorithm to actually come out and classify something and tell us we think based on what we've seen before and how our, uh, our how our algorithm works, we think that this collection of words and how it's put together is random, okay? And we've got then actually come back and given that some, um, some, some particular risk scores. But what we've also done in here is we've used some extra machine learning to help identify what a workstation is, um, um, what a server is, what a user is and what they're doing. And then grouping all of these things together to, again, give us a meaningful outcome and a meaningful output to an analyst for them to be able to not only just use this very clever machine learning thing that happens here, but then build that together with all the other pieces of information we've got to them. That means that me, an analyst, the person actually using this platform, you know, there are many more of those than there are data scientists in an organization that I can then understand the output from this thing and I can read the story of actually what's happened here by this person logging on, nothing weird with that, and then what they do, and then look at maybe perhaps some of the um, some of the models and some of the data to help us with our anomaly detection that actually happens into here. And we can actually see, you know, this person in here is is logging on to a country that um, that they don't normally access websites for, um, and we can actually start start to see some of the data insights that are in there, and then look at the models that are being used. Um, for that kind of information. And we can see some of the things that we've learned before of where this person normally accesses data. This is a categorical model. Um, and uh, you know, we can see the categories of, of information country in this particular example that's been used. Um, and we can then use that for our statistical an analysis to then start identifying our anomalies. And then when we see an anomaly to this, which this one is, this this country name here is an outlier. It's not happened before. Um, we see that as a non-anomaly, we flash it up, and then we give it some, some risk scoring and then perhaps adjust those risk scores with some of the Bayesian scoring. I.e. for something that happens a lot, we actually start to move the scoring slightly faster than the data models can actually go through. So lots and lots of things that are used in here that combine machine learning, um, statistical analysis and the Bayesian scoring to actually form a useful output, something meaningful that can be ingested by anyone who uses the platform. Okay, All that right. was a quick look Great. at uh, the exhibition stuff. Appreciative of time with a couple of minutes left. I just want to get some questions in. All right, perfect. Thank you, Dan. It was very clear about how exhibition leverage the, the difference between AI, machine learning, and, and other algorithms. Uh, we got a few questions. All right, one question is um, maybe for Dave because it's more more general question. Um, we can see that false positive was a pain in the ass in the beginning. Um, how did it get better, or is it still an issue in, in all those products? Uh, so that probably uh, is about the nitty introduction eh? about the uh, result that we got there. The thing is that with machine learning is you don't know upfront what your result will be, and if your model or the algorithm that you use, like uh, the random forest in this case, um, is the best algorithm for the problem, you don't know, and that's why you also learn. Uh, you also do learning on the hyperparameters, and um, like a random forest is what they call an ensemble learning, where you put um, in this case multiple decision trees on each other, but you could combine like uh, decision trees with uh, support factor machines and stuff like that, and use other algorithms. It's all about you know getting the right data in and letting the the machine learn and learn, and that's why it takes so much time and, and resources and power, let's say, 
Uh, this is also why it's done on GPUs because um, with the, the vector formats, the tensor uh, way it works uh, goes faster, and you need to you know let the algorithm do its thing, and then hopefully you get the right result. That's it's it's not the exact sciences that you know. I throw this at it, and I will have a good result. You don't know up front. You just do it, and you let it. Uh, that's why you need the cost testing and see what the results is. So uh, will it improve? Um, depending on uh, the algorithms you use. I'm, I'm not sure if the if I would pour, put more power and resources in the calculation, it might improve, yes, but um, we don't know if the random forest is the right algorithm for this problem, but that's how machine learning works. I think it's important to um, just to add a little bit to that. I think that's why it's important to have this layered approach. Um, I mean, all of us, us vendors on here that have, that have discussed this, you know, machine learning is part of what everyone does here, but it's not everything. You can't just turn up to a data set, unwrap a box of machine learning and expect useful outcomes from it. It needs to be married together, uh, take the output from that and let that do and derive some insight for you and then go and make some mathematical calculations from it. You've seen we've all started to do the same thing by creating those plots and those charts, but then use that to then feed something else and then maybe take a risk based approach or do some statistical analysis of perhaps machine learning says that's bad. Now, is that bad compared to what everyone else is doing or have I seen this elsewhere? Does it match something else? So, um, yeah, I, 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 th I think it's uh, yeah, it, it, it was clear there. Yeah, it doesn't fix everything. Not at all. All right, great. Um, other question um, from the audience is, uh, it looks like your examples are unsupervised. Do you only use unsupervised or is there also supervised learning in the product? And how does this work? I think this is for um, Central One or Silver Ford. I'm not sure. Maybe both. Yeah, I can answer it um, for Sentinel One at least. Uh, we have many different usages of machine learning. Some of them are supervised and some are unsupervised. Um, for the supervised learning, uh, we have first of all there are known data sets of malicious files, if it's like the Ember dataset or VirusTotal or other places, I'm not really sure where did we get our dataset from, but we have datasets of malicious files. Benign files are very easy to get, like you have plenty of them on each machine you have, so it's very easy to, to get a benign dataset. And also we have, as I've said, the MDR services in Sentinel-1, which are plenty of analysts that look over data from many different places, so we have tag data, and therefore we can use this data for many different tasks. Um, so yes, we also use supervised learning in some cases. All right, that's clear. And maybe Gail, for your part? Yeah, so actually then my answer is quite the same. So um, I demonstrated just one algorithm, but we use both supervised and unsupervised learning. For example, um, when we want to um, find service accounts, you do that uh, behaves, uh, uh, they have a robotic behavior, um, we have some classifications that provided by our customers and uh, uh, so we can do uh, proper um, uh, proper learning. Uh, so yeah, in general, we use both. All right, thanks for your answer. Um, maybe Dave, you want something to add about this topic because that, that was the last question or are we finished? Uh, maybe we should look a bit more at the time. I think uh, we can round it up. Uh, then if, if there are any more questions, I, I see there are more questions, but uh, we, we'll probably take them offline. And um, if there's more interest, you know, how to reach us, and I'll put on the last slide here. Understand. All right, again, if, if you have any more questions about, about AI or, or the vendors particularly, please contact me and I will make sure you get in touch with the right people. All right, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, there's a small uh, questionnaire after this webinar, just a few questions. Uh, please fill it out. That will give us a lot of feedback. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody, um, Davey, um, Ido, Gal, uh, Dan. Thanks very much by, for joining us and, uh, and doing this today.